Welcome to one of our biographies of important Christian figures from the history of Lincolnshire and Nottinghamshire. In this session, we are looking at John Hunt, one of the most significant missionaries who established the gospel in Fiji, a job which cost him his life. My name is Adrian Gray. I'm a historian working with Pilgrims and Prophets to develop interest in the Christian heritage around Lincolnshire and Nottinghamshire. This is one of my favourite stories. John Hunt was probably born at Highcombe Moor, which is now a suburban area of Lincoln, but in 1812 was an agricultural area. His father was a farm bailiff, but he lost his job when ownership of the land changed. Hunt is often associated with Swinderby, a village closer to Newark along the old Roman Foss Way, but actually he only moved there when he was a young man. The most important event in his life occurred nearby at Thorpe, this was where he experienced true conversion, but we will come to that later. The Hunt family moved to the nearby city of Lincoln, but Hunt's father struggled to find decent employment. They were faced with poverty and possible starvation unless they went to the poor law. However, at that time you could only claim poor law assistance from your parish of origin, so the family moved to Boulderton near Newark, the home parish of Hunt's father. His father may have fallen on hard times, but he had had some significant experiences. According to family stories, he had joined the army and then deserted to join the Navy. In the Navy, he had been present at the very famous Battle of the Nile in 1798. The family moved to Boulderton where his father became interested in the Ranters, as the primitive Methodists were called at that time. William Close, their inspirational leader, actually came and preached in Newark in 1817. Hunt himself left school at the age of about 10. He was not particularly religious as a young man and rather disapproved of his father's interest in the Ranters. However, when he was 16, he nearly died of an illness and this began a change in his outlook. He began to read a Bible, although he started with revelations and found it quite challenging. Soon after this, a friend took him to a Methodist meeting for the first time. Eventually, he made his first attempt to speak a few words in a meeting. He was not a very strong boy and was not really suited to farm work. In fact, others used to tease him about it. And this was really most of the work that was available in his area. Eventually, Hunt had to stand for hire at Newark Marketplace and actually was taken on to work for a woman at Swinderby. This proved to be a key moment in his life. At Swinderby, there was a Methodist society and a fellow worker there was also a Methodist. Later, Swinderby became celebrated as a key step in John Hunt's story and the picture shows the chapel that was built a few years afterwards. While he was here, he heard his new companions talking about the Holy Spirit, but he did not really understand. But he heard a good preacher was coming and determined to go and hear him. In 1819, John Hunt went to hear that good preacher who was called John Smith and who was preaching in the nearby village of Thorpe. Hunt left rather dissatisfied, so he decided to go back in afterwards and found that Smith was still there, praying with those in need. This is what Hunt wrote. Immediately, a most overwhelming influence came upon me, so that, oh, I cried loud for mercy for the sake of Christ. While I was, in a minute, completely bathed with tears and perspiration, as if I'd been thrown into a river. He felt his heart full of joy unspeakable. Hunt was about 17 when he experienced this conversion. After a rather poor effort at speaking in a prayer meeting at Swinderby, Hunt preached for the first time at Girton and then became a circuit preacher around Lincoln. In 1833, the Reverend William Smith identified him as capable of greater service. At this stage, Hunt was thinking about going to South Africa to join Laidman Hodgson. 
Whilst living at Potter Hanworth in 1834 and then at Waddington, his power as a preacher increased. Hunt went off to study in London at Hoxton, the first Methodist training college which opened in 1834. There he got to know other future missionaries such as James Calvert. Hunt began to reconsider missionary work in South Africa, instead opting for the challenging cannibal-ridden islands of Fiji. Calvert planned to go there too. Funding for Hunt was provided by Mrs Sarah Brackenbury of Raithby in Lincolnshire. She was the widow of the important early Methodist Robert Carr Brackenbury, who had built one of the first Methodist chapels beside their house and who had been a close friend of John Wesley himself. She agreed to support Hunt and also Calvert financially. At Hoxton, Hunt was also influenced by the Reverend John Hanna, a leading Methodist who had been born in Lincoln. So local connections were very important for him. Hunt married Hannah Summers of Newton-on-Trent in February 1838, when they were both 21. Hannah was from a more comfortable background, although in fact her family only had a few acres of land. This was a village where Wesleyanism was strong. John Wesley himself had preached here on a number of occasions. Then the couple set off for London, Gravesend and the months of voyage to Fiji via Australia. Hunt joined David Cargill, who had been there several years. Hunt was deployed to go to Rewa. After a month, he was able to start reading the sermons, his own sermons, in the local language. But he also reported some terrifying stories. This is one of the ways that he wrote about them. Two thirds of all children were boiled and eaten, he said. Every village had its human butcher. Aged parents were eaten by their children. A man would often cook his best wife or tender child as a feast for his closest friends. Well, just before Christmas 1838, and after a hard beginning, conversions began to break out on one of the islands. Later, Viwa became a real success, when in 1845, the nephew of a chief accepted Christ and soon others followed, a key factor being Hunt's skill in languages. Hunt ran schools, taught the faith and convinced the king to stop the practices of wife strangling and cannibalism. In fact, one of the old priests had had a dream in which his gods told him they were leaving now that Hunt had come. But his skill at languages was at the heart of his success. The progress of the gospel at Fiji could be difficult to assess. Chief Namo Simalua decided to build a church, but then he threatened to trample to death people who did not help with the work. And other times, Hunt was hampered by rivalries between the different chiefs. Not far away lay the island of Mbao, the highest seat of Fiji power. The ruler, King Takop Mbao, was called the butcher of his people. But over time, Hunt gradually won the king's respect. When one of Takombao's chief warriors became a Christian, the king was not pleased, but he did not use violence. So excitement about Jesus spread across the islands. Gradually, brutal and cannibalistic practices were dropped as the people became devout believers in Christ. One evening, as Fijian Christians were worshipping together, a large group of chiefs surrounded their church and threatened to kill everyone inside. The congregants response was to say and do nothing. In the end, one chief pushed his way in, brandishing his club, but immediately fell to the floor. When other warriors entered and they all collapsed as well, so that in the end, 30 lay helpless on the ground. It was as if they had been struck down by the Christian's God. By morning, every young man of that murderous mob had received Jesus. Hunt worked in Rewa, Somosomo, and then after three years at Viwa from 1842. All the time he improved his language skills. He was instrumental in the conversion of the warrior Varani in 1845. 
Arguably, he learned his trade as a missionary at Wewa and Summer Summo, and then applied what he had learned most successfully at Viwa. At one posting, he and his wife were greeted with the news that one of the king's sons had drowned. They discovered that the plan of the Fijians was to strangle all this man's wives so that they could accompany him to the spirit land. There was nothing that the hunts could do about it, and they had to listen to the sound of 16 women being strangled who were then buried near their house. Whilst travelling to various mission stations on the islands, Hunt worked on the translation of the Bible, completing the New Testament and beginning the Old Testament. He became an expert on Fijian culture and his evangelistic work was increasingly successful. Fiji had its own established religions and temples, so educating the new believers was crucial. John Hunt trained villagers to teach the Bible. The lectures were compiled into a manual of theology and then used for decades. He gradually expanded his work on translating the Bible itself. On December the 1st, 1847, Hunt wrote to some friends in England. We can now report upwards of 3,000 who attend our ministry and that of our teachers every Lord's Day. Lavuka was the main residence for most of the European. But the Hunts were many days travel away from there, often by a very uncomfortable form of ship. They suffered from illness frequently. Mrs Hunt herself caught dysentery whilst pregnant and her baby died after only 12 days of life. There were many chiefs in the islands and their rivalry could be deadly. One day in 1840 at Somo Somo, a rival chief was cut into pieces near Hunt's house. Then 11 other men were killed, cooked and eaten. After Somo Somo, he moved to Viwa, perhaps with a sense of relief. Hunt also studied the practices of the Fijians, who were becoming a source of endless fascination to European and American audiences. Because the early Methodists were very keen on preserving their own history, we have some wonderful pictures of some of the early mission chapels built on Fiji. Here's one of the chapel at Viwa. Hunt died of dysentery and exhaustion in 1848. As he was dying, he said, let me go, a heap of inconsistencies, backslidings and unfaithfulness. Let me go, as I trust as I shall, through divine mercy alone, for I have nothing at all in myself to heaven. There is nothing in me as an example to recommend, which is not much better furnished in the lives of many which have been written. We can make our own judgment of that rather humble self-assessment. His final words were, Lord comfort my poor heart. A small grave was made for him, but his real memorial came in 1853, when his first work on a Fijian Bible was published. Takombao at Viwa had not been a supporter of Hunt in 1845. Until his own death, Hunt continued to pray that he would be saved. The day after Hunt died, King Takombao came to pay his last respects to the missionary. He was given a letter written by John not long before he died, expressing love and including a prayer for the monarch. King Takombao was deeply moved and later he too came to faith in Jesus in 1854. He renounced cannibalism. At the king's baptism, a most unlikely crowd gathered. Widows of husbands he had killed, relatives of men he had eaten, and adult children who had formerly vowed revenge against Tacombao for the deaths of their father. The Wesleyan church in Fiji flourished for a long time after Hunt's death. Chapels were built all across the islands, including one built in 1859 by the local people themselves. Hunt was survived by his wife and children, including their eldest daughter Eliza Ann and their second daughter Hannah. The family all went back to Newton-on-Trent, 
including the children who had never seen England before. In fact, Hannah Hunt, his widow, became something of a celebrity on the mission fundraising circuit. And the poetic Mr Otter of Stokeham, a little village nearby, wrote a poem for her when she came to visit. Mrs Hunt used to come to Otter's annual missionary days, along with hundreds of other people travelling off and on farm wagons. Today, Otter's little Wesleyan chapel in Stokeham is abandoned and overgrown. It is well worth visiting Newton-on-Trent. Head to the churchyard where Hannah Hunt and her daughter can be found buried side by side. Her daughter's gravestone has words rarely seen in England, born in Fiji. Fiji remains one of the places in the world with the highest percentage of Methodists, over 60% of the Christian population and around 34% of the total at the last count. In 2012, Fiji celebrated John Hunt's 200th birthday, but the weather was terrible. John Hunt's grave has been restored. At Viwa, there is a new John Hunt Memorial Church and the minister still lives nearby in a house used by Hunt. This church appears to be doing rather better than the one of the same name in England. Another John Hunt Memorial Church was built at Thorpe on the Hill near Lincoln and opened in 1910, despite what it says on the plaque on the front. Fittingly, this was the place where Hunt first knew true conversion. Mr Hambly, a son-in-law Hunt had never known, came from California and stayed at Newton for the celebrations. Sadly, this is no longer a church. The primary school in Boulderton has been named the John Hunt School. The name was chosen for it in 1959. People who used to go to this school many years ago told me that they used to have annual Fiji days. One man had been there when it was renamed in 1959 and remembered being in the choir recording songs to be transmitted to Fiji via Australian radio. They were educated about John Hunt's life. The school name is helping keep his name alive, of course, for future generations. However, its current website says little or nothing actually about John Hunt himself. So Hunt is not quite forgotten, but in his homeland, few people really understand why he is so important. That's why I have told this story. If you're interested in Christian history or the history of Nottinghamshire and Lincolnshire, you can find out more in my books. All of these are available from the website of Bookworm Retford or the usual suppliers. Restless Souls Pilgrim Roots tells the story of how the faith developed in this area up to the 1660s. From Here We Change the World tells you about interesting places around Newark and Retford connected with faith, including people like the Pilgrim Fathers and Wesley. Whilst we also have a general interest book about all the fascinating places around Newark and Sherwood. Thank you for listening to the story of John Hunt.